All right, let's dive in. So we're going to move into a panel discussion. It's going to be informal, and then we'll invite questions from you all, and hopefully it'll be a bit of a discussion. So on our panel today, we have Peggy Awesh. Over the course of her career, Awesh has produced... Well, <laughs> yeah, let's do this. <laughs> Hell yeah. Awish has produced one of the most heterogeneous bodies of work in the field of experimental film and video. Her tools include narrative and documentary styles, improvised performance and scripted dialogue, sync sound, found footage, digital animation, and crude pixel vision video. Using a range of approaches, she has extended the project, the project initiated by 1960s and 70s American avant-garde film and has augmented that tr tradition with an investigation of cultural identity and the role of the subject. Next on our panel, we have Madame Dolores. Let's bring the energy. <laughs> Madame Dolores I is, I, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe we move the light up here? Yeah. No, just leave it. Okay. Madame Dolores is a multi-platform, cross-disciplinary artist who employs sound, vision, text, and performance as storytelling tools to create radical, sometimes co controversial, cultural engagements. At the heart of her work is a humanistic empathy that questions our ability to coexist and reimagines new mythologies. Her practice is rooted in responding to compelling questions about cultural definitions, the root of hatred, cognitive dissonance, binary systems, and social, social conflicts of us versus them. She thinks of what she does as a social cultural anthro anthropology, employing the ethnographic technique by calling audio, text, and images to create a record of our struggle to be human. Her textural, visual, musical work responds to burgeoning questions about human behavior and inhuman cruelty. How are these confounding, at times disturbing actions seen through the lens of justice, compassion, and understanding? And then we have Megan Kolek. Yay. <laughs> Meg, she, her, they, is a filmmaker and educator from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, currently residing in Los Angeles, California. Kolek participated in Prototype Pittsburgh's 19, 2019 Women's Work Incubator Program, which helped jumpstart her independent production company, Dumpstar Media. Kolek and Dumpstar Media are known for their camp comedies that highlight the queer community and challenge societal norms. And last, but certainly not least, our moderator, Stephen Haynes. Stephen, Stephen, woo! <laughs> Stephen is a motion picture archivist, programmer, and historian with a passion for promoting overlooked media forms and stories, particularly those related to the Pittsburgh region. In 2016, he founded Flea Market Films and began sharing real analog motion picture film with audiences and he co-founded Pittsburgh Sound and Image in 2022. Between the two, Stephen has organized more than 70 handcrafted movie events for audiences in and around the city. And so without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Stephen and our amazing guests. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you for having us. <laughs> and, um, and for putting, th thanks to you and, and Inbar for putting together this uh, amazing series. It's been a dream come true. Um, so, you know, so, so, the, so the connective tissue here with these films tonight are um, a big part of the whole evening is Pittsburgh filmmakers. <laughs> we're, we're right back here in, in the old home. Uh, so I'm wondering about um, the connection each of you have with, with Pittsburgh filmmakers. Uh, if, if there's um, something you'd like to talk about from your from your relationship with the organization, um, and may, maybe describing what it meant to you, if anything. <laughs> and, and don't forget to use your mics. <laughs> okay, I'll go first. Um, well, I'm, um, you know, I'm the old timer, perhaps, on the panel because I worked at the Pittsburgh Filmmakers uh, in 19, 
80 to 82, I was the programmer, and um, I had come from um, the mattress factory. I had worked at the mattress factory before that, and before that I was in college. And I studied with experimental filmmakers. Um, Tony Conrad and Paul Sheritz were my professors at college. And uh, structural filmmakers and Tony, you know, kind of interesting performative weirdo and Sherrod's structural filmmaker. Um, you know, and, I, and so my grounding was very much in the experimental and underground scene. Um, and coming to Pittsburgh, uh, wow, I found it, it to be very much home. And uh, the community was really strong, uh, very diverse in a way, um, surprising in a town kind of this size to have so many filmmakers. There were diary, people that worked and diaristically there were people more like on the optical printer working sort of more formally uh, and mathematically. And then there was kind of the punk uh, group that I was a part of that worked primarily in Super 8 uh, and followed the bands around um, and shot, um, I don't know, odd dramas, I would say. So anyway, I was the programmer and I, I booked um, uh, out-of-towners, fam some fam really famous people, uh, people that were coming through on tour and a lot of local people. One of the best programs I did, um, in my recollection, um, uh, I did a group show uh, with a bunch of the local filmmakers and nobody had any their films done. So I put them on the calendar and I made up titles for their movies. So Rick Pito's film was called Dreams Congo, which is very, if anybody knows Rick Pito, that's just like totally perfect. And there, um, uh, Rich Moore was a knife point at the, at, the, at the knife point at the Greyhound station, I believe was the name of his film. But anyway, it was kind of just this, and everybody made films. And I thought, oh, this is really generative, this kind of idea, or just to get people going. So I started doing a thing, giving people deadlines, and that seemed to work um, up, to, up to a point, <laughs> but it, it did, uh, it, Anyway, was, that was a, a good experience. But I worked in uh, Oakland at the old Pittsburgh Filmmakers on Oakland Avenue, where you went up the stairs with the Maya Darren uh, image that was on the wall there. And if you went right, you went to the theater, and if you went left, you went to the gallery. So the, I moved to New York after that. I worked for uh, George Romero on a creep show. And um, I got to be very close to Natalka Voslikov and also Margie Strasser who were my teammates uh, in chaos and fun, who I met uh, on, the, on the Romero production, and then uh, the rest is history. Next. <laughs> Next. Well, this is fascinating because um, that CMU has purchased this because uh, I was studying at CMU in 84, and the only way I could take filmmaking was to go to filmmakers. They weren't connected at that time. And it was the one in Oakland. And Shauna Sharif had her African dance class underneath. So there was this pulsing energy happening underneath filmmakers that I don't, I don't know, I felt it informed me and, and it excited me to be there. And um, it was a place where I got to experiment and really, um, bring what, and, and my sister's in a lot of these, and my sister was my punk rock dance partner. Like, we usually would kick off the whole, like if the band started, we would grab hands and start slam dancing. So I was just really trying to capture the energy of our kind of collaborative friendship as sisters and, and the energy of the scene that we were so a part of. We spent so much time at the Electric Banana. <laughs> And, and, and really just um, highlighting the people around us that were in the scene. So, you know, you will um, see fellow students. Um, Joseph Kelly was in the one film and um, he and I worked on each other's films. And um, I used to mix uh, cornstarch uh, for the semen in his films. <laughs> I was the semen maker. And, um, you know, he was doing a lot of um, really experimental gay erotica, and I was, like, so proud to be the semen maker. And, <laughs> and he would provide feedback on my film. So, you know, Filmmakers has just um, <laughs> a lot of touch points in my life. So I'll just leave it at that and pass it on. 
Is your sister the badass? Yes. <laughs> Knew it. Um, yeah, I was in like the last generation of filmmakers. Um, I started taking classes here um, when I was 18 um, in 2010 and um, then started working at Filmmakers two years later. Um, it's like TA, librarian, I got into the equipment office. Um, then I taught um, one of the production classes until, um, until it was all over uh, in like 2018. Um, and then I kind of helped move over to uh, the other building. I was there to the bitter end, um, along with a lot of people who are here tonight um, as well. So it's really good to be back. I really feel like I grew up here um, at Pittsburgh Filmmakers. I, uh, I was a fairly sheltered um, until I was like 18. Uh, and I knew that there was a community um, of people who liked stuff like I did and like who were making things that I wanted to make. Um, and I'm glad that I found it um, at that time. Um, so yeah, I really feel like it was family and um, it was, yeah, definitely uh, made me who I am today and influenced a lot of my work, um, just the people who were here. Well, yeah, so, so there you have it. Community. I mean, it sounds like that's all three of you talk about um, how, how how filmmakers was was this community for you. It, it introduced you to other other makers, and uh, which which in turn fueled your own creativity. Uh, so I, I think yeah, I think I think that really speaks to the one of the things that made the organization the place so special. Um, so we had a, we had a few names mentioned there. Joe Kelly is, is that is that the same the same person? Does it, does it, maybe maybe you know Christiana, but I was just connecting as, as you were speaking. But maybe somebody here knows. Did uh, did Joe Kelly work with with Pam Lewis with with Zed Armstrong? Is that is Zed here tonight? Yeah, I, I I'm I'm, re I'm remembering uh, seeing that name at the Studio for Creative Inquiry when when, when we were uh, uh, watching. Some of Pam's work there, and um, yeah, so it's there. There's always these. It, it's such a. Uh, there's always these these connections to be made, which are always always really fascinating to me. Um, so, are, are there are there any other individuals that that you haven't mentioned who you you want to you want to talk about who were you you feel were particularly important to in your your Pittsburgh filmmakers social circle in in your time there. Um, not trying to put you on the spot because you know then if you forget someone you, you, you might you might get you might get yelled at but if if there's anybody else you you're you're thinking of um, I'm always I always love to love to learn about these connections and, and new people um a lot of the people here tonight like I was saying like my burner crew in the very back row um shout out to them um, <laughs> and um yeah I mean uh, someone who's not here, John Canteen, unless John, no, um, also was uh, like a really empowering figure who definitely helped a lot of like young female filmmakers to like like put cameras in their hands and um, make uh, a lot of us the TAs and like really that was really special because um, I didn't find that a lot of other places, but I found that here. Um, but yeah, it is the kind of thing, it's kind of too many to name for me, and it's a little awkward because a lot of them are out there, yeah. My stint at Filmmakers was short and sweet and powerful, and uh, kind of led into other aspects of my art making where uh, it led to performance, it led to um, being in punk rock bands, it led to playwriting and launching plays, so, and, and also um, staying kind of dedicated to this, uh, and I think you mentioned in one of the questions, this horror kind of genre that runs underneath in, in my work, which is um, dedicated to kind of presenting a truth to people, and recognizing that uh, that truth can be seen as horror and utilizing horror to kind of flip that and get people um, 
closer to the truth. I mean, every day we're watching horrible things on our phones. So what actually is horror anymore? So um, <laughs> that's my question to you all. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question really because there was basically my whole world was, you know, it's, it could be a portrait of all these various people that uh, circulated around the Pittsburgh filmmakers and the Electric Banana and the museum, um, and everyone was a little piece of the puzzle, really, and there was a lot of uh, influences back and forth, um, and people formed cliques, but it was also, um, you know, much bigger than that. I think people were much more broad-minded than their their clique. Um, so I don't want to really mention any names except one, <laughs> and that would have to be Roger Jacoby, and you know, he he was very formative for me. Um, his connections to the Warhol scene, also the hand processing, the beautiful nature of his films, and also him as a brilliant and cranky individual who was very uncompromising. And I, I think he was uh, kind of a model for me. Well, thank you. Th thanks for sharing that. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad we got a Roger Jacoby shout out in, in here before the, before the night was over. Uh, Christiana, since since you bring up the the connection to horror, and you know, since since that is something something we, we had talked about a, a little bit previously, um, so so you, I, th I think you've just you've just explained that that horror was a, a conscious influence on on these films. I, is that right? That the horror, horror as a, as, a, as a genre. Um, Romero. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this is where I'm going. Um, with this. Yeah. Uh, imagine. Two little afro deutsch girls sitting in front of the television with their father eating a giant bucket of ice cream and watching the Night of the Living Dead. And, and, and watching the main character, this black man, slap the shit out of people. That changed my life. That changed everything about what you could communicate and, and, and how you could normalize identities in, in some ways and how you could utilize horror to talk about these kind of undercurrents of social justice and also the humor of it. Like my sister and I both love horror and it, she uses it to help her go to sleep. I don't know. <laughs> And um, I find the humor in it. I mean, it's, it's an ongoing battle of good and evil, and it simplifies it in some way, but like I can see just a little bit of horror, and, and maybe I'm twisted, uh, in just about anything. Because in what people are creating are their biases and, and their projections of what they think other people are, right? And so they can represent certain misconceptions through the way they um, choose the costumes, or the way they uh, choose to have certain characters do things, or the way that there aren't any um, representations of people of color in anything that they make, right? So it's this push and pull of um, trying to bring people to this table of humanity, but recognizing that we all, in our own kind of ways, are biased in the way we create things. Yada, yada, yada. I, so, so I, I, I do hesitate to bring up the Romero connection, but I, that is where I was going with that. Uh, just because, you know, part of when when people talk about film in Pittsburgh in the past, everybody talks about Romero, which is great. I love Romero, but I, I I'm more interested in um, as as we said in, in my in, in my bio, the the overlooked stuff, which is you know how I how I keep coming to yeah and. and the, I'm, I'm coming. Yeah, I, was, I, I wanted to ask you, Peggy, about about oh, you. I, I just I just wanted to relate an anecdote. I don't know if anybody in the room remembers <laughs> this, but one day at the Pittsburgh Filmmakers, David Cronenberg wandered in, and he had been shooting something somewhere, and he was just like he came around, and I remember Marilyn Levin was like, "Oh my God, what do we do now? What do we do? You know, it's David Cronenberg. He's like sitting on the couch, and they gave him a glass of water, and um, so she called George." And he came over, and they sat at the filmmakers and had a long conversation. 
and just chatted with each other. I don't even know if they had known each other from before. Does anybody know this story except me? I've never heard this one, no. Yeah. yeah. They had the day wrong. Oh. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. It, oh, that's like 1981 or something like that. It's Pittsburgh. Oh, that came after that. So, the, so what the story is that they knew he was coming, but he came the wrong day, uh, and he show, he showed up. But there was a really, a really beautiful, you know, I mean, I was working, I was just kind of, I was, you know, not going to interrupt them, but it was just like flitting in and out, and it was just really a nice moment. So uh, you, you, have another, you have another major Romero connection, but, which you talked about before, uh, but, but yeah, with, with, uh, with, with how you got to know uh, Peggy, and, or, I'm sorry, <laughs> you're Peggy. Sorry, how Peggy got to know Natalka and, and Margie and Margie Strasser. Uh, do, do you want to? Uh, some folks here might might not be aware of that. Well, Maybe you want to say a few words about that. Well, I was hired as a production assistant on Creepshow, and I did a lot of, I um, well, I did a lot of production assistant type things, <laughs> um, among them making the green goo in that one episode, and I babysat for um, Adrian. It was an Adrian Barbeau, uh, her kid. Oh no! It was no. It was um, Stephen King's kid. I babysat Stephen King's. That was one of my jobs. But um, if anyone knows, if anyone remembers Natalka, she had gotten hired also as a production assistant. And she, uh, you know, they someone met her. Uh, this guy who's an assistant director, Peter Giuliano. And he, of course, he's going to hire Natalka because she was just so entertaining and interesting. Not that she had the skills to do the babysitting. <laughs> and work with the green goo like I did. I mean, seri seriously. So she paraded around and, you know, whatever, uh, and did her thing. And anyway, it was really fun to have her on set. And then Margie was an assistant editor. So she was actually skilled <laughs> and a little higher rank. But um, anyway, the, we got to know each other on the, on the movie. And, uh, and, and then you and Natalka went on to collaborate on, on, some, on some work. I, I, so I, I have to clarify... This day's death. So, so we have the names we have on there are are the names in the credits. But that that film comes from Natalka's reels. I consider it Natalka's films. It's got her her editing notes on on the can. Um, it's shot in according to the edge codes uh, seventy four and seventy eight. Could be a year later than that. But. Um, are you? Did, did did you? That that sure looks like you in, in that in that. You mirror. mean in the movie? What, what's the title of the movie? This day's death. This the day's second death. One, the second one we saw, uh, the, with with the Monroeville Mall footage. I, I, have, I have no memory of that whatsoever, and I okay. don't think I don't think I was there. <laughs> it's a very right. nice little film. It's very lovely, but I don't think I had anything to do with it. Good good to settle it once and for all. <laughs> Okay, I thought uh, we, we see the face obscured by the the Super 8 camera, and uh, I, I had speculated it might be you, but per, but perhaps not. It's 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 not. It's uh, but we'll call it a, a Natalka Vazica film. But you did you did collaborate in some capacity on on some films. Uh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I made a whole bunch of films. I made a film called Philosophy in the Bedroom with Natalka and Nick Tallow, like sitting and having a conversation about sex. It's it's a really funny film. They're very, they're amazing comedy together, um, and I made um, well she's in a couple of things, and then I shot her movie Teenage Love, which is a feature length film that features Natalka and Reed Paley as youngsters, teenagers, and their little foibles among you know their little romantic episodes, and then them as kind of bored and agitated adults when they're a couple and they are fighting all the time. So it, it goes between the adolescence and the adult versions of themselves. And that was fun. That's, and uh, it features a, a really fantastic performance by Francis Lackey in the, in the Carnegie Museum. Uh, a, a, a blind date that Natalka's mother set her up on is with this pseudo-intellectual Francis Lackey who knew all about the paintings and was very irritating. Uh, in, in the movie. Um, 
and anyway, there's other things. And then I worked with Margie a lot. I made, uh, into the 90s, I made um, a, um, a piece called Strange Weather with Margie that we collaborated on, the shot in Pixel Vision, and shot, we shot in Florida about um, drug taking and uh, a f sort of a fantasy about drugs and being holed up in this place in, in Miami, and shot that on Pixel Vision video. That's, that's early 90s. Nice. And then, the, and, then, and then we all dispersed kind of after that. The other thing I have in the talk is, which I think is incredible, and I have a lot of it online, is um, starting in the mid-90s, she started to leave messages on my answering machine the length of the tape. So if it was a 20-minute tape, you got 20 minutes. If it was a 45-minute tape, I got 45 minutes. And she would just, um, you know, it's politics, uh, what she thought about uh, the government and about her medication and about Pittsburgh and, uh, you know, about the art scene. I mean, it's a, a very wide ranging. And it, I realized at a certain point that I was supposed to save them and this was an artwork. It wasn't just like her, you know, it wasn't just like her leaving me a message. It really was a thing. And it was very involved. And they're fantastic, if anybody wants to hear them. Um, Right, I'm, I'm sure she called a lot of people. <laughs> Actually, we, it'd be interesting to put them all together and make a big inventory, because it, it, it becomes a time capsule of, of not just her and not just Pittsburgh, but of a particular time in the kind of mid-90s. It was very interesting, and she's, of course, extremely acerbic and opinionated about uh, the world and world politics at the time. But it, it, I think it's incredible. I've never really done that much with that as an archive, but it's... a uh, uh, you know, it's, if anybody wants to hear any of them, let me know. Or if anybody wants to do something with some of the audio recordings, you're, you're welcome to it. Both of you talk, Christiana and Peggy, talk about how the intersection of horror and punk aesthetics and how it affected your filmmaking. You did a little bit by these anecdotes of history, but I want to hear more about formal characteristics and, um, yeah, how deep they went. Well, I mean, um, you know, we were, my generation, we were in the era of uh, Reagan, <laughs> which is a horror in itself. And um, this need to push back physically against this and being able to do that through the music, um, doing it with our bodies. You know, for me, that started to, um, translate and wanting to um, represent that um, in the bodies, the way they're moving and dancing and, and this utilizing the, the symbols of chains and whips. Like what does it mean when it's in the hand of a black person um, and, and a person, a black person who's a black punk rocker, like, you know, kind of, I'm, I'm still like, I'm look, I haven't seen these in a while, <laughs> you know, and I've never seen them on the big screen. so. I'm really sitting here also kind of unpacking, like, what was I thinking? <laughs> I, had, I definitely had something in mind, but it was, um, <laughs> it was just this blend of what we were doing on stage, and then the, um, you know, there would be times when, you know, my sister and I would be the only black people slam dancing, and the slam dancing would turn violent, and we would know the difference between the dancing and then being attacked. And so just kind of like uh, finding a way to represent this um, feeling of recognizing that even though we're here and we're trying to fight the system, that it within that system, she and I were still fighting a whole nother thing, right? And, and fi trying to find a way to represent that in, in these films. Um, well, I, I mean, it's a, that's a good question. Um, I think at some, you know, like early on, you know, there were the visionary filmmakers um, who were interested in their inner eye and sort of expressing their unconscious. And then at some point it kind of flipped where you were in maybe a, you might call it postmodernism or something, but um, there was a time when it became possible really to sort of work with genre, work with forms that were already established 
and they're already there and you could kind of work with them and recontextualize them. So we, instead of originary, you became a recontextualizer. And I think I was really interested in genre for that and it gave an incredible freedom to sort of work with tropes and work with forms and then kind of um, subvert them and, uh, and re reinitiate the material into something else. It ended up being personal or about women or about sexuality. Different, you can go many different directions with it. Um, and I think particularly for women, to be able to sort of act, I mean, this is partly, I think, what I saw in your work, um, to be able to sort of act out in this kind of hyper-violent way or hyper-horistic -hor way, you're able to, there's a lot of freedom there. It's not like you want women to get battered, but, you know, it's, it's this other thing where you want the freedom to be able to express the rage and the fear and the um, uh, passion that horror movies allow. And I think m the movies allowed women to do that. And women, a woman behind the camera working with other women, I made a couple of horror, horror movies, uh, all with uh, female uh, protagonists, that that was a very liberating, very liberating experience. What about you, Megs? Uh, um, do, you, do, do you feel like, uh, I, I feel like I have to extend this to you. Do, you, do you feel like horror, punk, Romero, um, have, have have these have any of these things uh, had had a have they shaped your work as, as an artist or or beyond? Um, thank you. Uh, I I mainly do comedy, um, but I think that there's a lot of crossover um, with critiquing society and taking like the fear of real life and channeling it in a way that like when you're talking about flipping something on its head and like inverting it and perverting it in in a way that that you are in control of it, um, I think that there's a lot of crossover there, and um, and that's definitely something that I do in my work. Um, really think about like well in terms of comedy like who is the butt of the joke and like yes we're laughing but why are we laughing and then how does that make us feel and I feel like in in what I do and um and a lot of like my um like satirical idols uh we're looking at um how to in a in a more like non-confrontational way like confront the ugly Yeah. Um, so I know I know I know you're in Los Angeles now. Recently, within within the last year or so. Um, so so you're still you still have a sense of of the the scene in Pittsburgh, the um, DIY scene. We'll we'll, 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 call, we'll call it that. Um, so I'm wondering, and and, and this this uh, might be something you'd like to contribute to, also, Christiana. Uh, do you? Um, well, so 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 you you you've been you were involved with filmmakers for a decade or more. Uh, you've seen you've seen things change across that time. You've certainly seen it uh, over over the over thirty uh, plus years, um, forty forty almost. Uh, <laughs> have you have you seen um, have you seen changes in within that kind of. <laughs> Have, have you seen changes within within those those kinds of scenes in Pittsburgh uh, in, in your in your times? I, I realize it's hard hard to characterize a scene, um, you know. But but what is a scene? But um, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if you've seen continuity or if, or if you've seen um, yeah uh, ebbs and flows. Well, one thing I want to share is when I. You know, you're, you're sharing your film in class, right? And for some reason, I was last. I tended to be last. But, you know, everyone's sharing their films and getting feedback. And I'm like, yeah. And then I showed my film with Joe, Joe Kelly. And it was like complete silence. <laughs> and it was like it had so upset people that... Um, it was it was this this control that you're talking about, like you're subverting this. You're you're doing this ultra non ultra violence. You're representing violence, and you're the woman, and you made this thing, and it just super upset the whole room. And and it was interesting too, because a lot of us in that classroom were punk rockers, and I'm like, well, 
I, I don't understand why everyone's upset because this is what we're talking about in our songs. This is why we're raging on our basses and our guitars and screaming in the microphones. And so that was like interesting to me because when it was flipped and shown, it, it, it uh, created this state of silence, which I think is interesting today because I think women are, and correct me if I'm wrong, women in here, <laughs> I think have more um, ways to be themselves and more ways to get that kind of critical feedback when they're doing something really outrageous. I think there's more room to kind of be yourself and, and receive that kind of critique you need to like grow and, and have that, that community that will help you uh, continue on in your craft. So I just wanted to share that as just a note yeah, thank you. That, that's, uh, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just trying to recall your filmmakers over, I'm sorry, yeah. can you one uh, more time? One more um, time. Yeah, so, so you had a pretty, you had a pretty, pretty unique perspective in, on, uh, at a, at a critical time in, in, in the life of Pittsburgh filmmakers and that you were involved there in, in the last, in the last decade or so. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, right, right. Um, so yeah, I, I left Pittsburgh um, uh, less than a year ago, um, but I'm back fairly often. Like my, um, my family is here, my community is here. Um, and um, yeah, I, the person I make movies with, um, Alistair McQueen. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Alistair's, uh, Alistair's a gem. Um, out of town right now, um, or else would definitely be here. Um, so Alistair's the other part of Dumpstar Media. And, um, and we had been making movies together since we met um, at Filmmakers in 2014, like right after he moved to Pittsburgh, um, because of Pittsburgh Filmmakers. Like he moved to Pittsburgh, he met um, Fat Man D, um, in, out in like California or something, and uh, and then and she was like, he, went to Europe with her. he did go to Europe with her. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and and Mandy was like, I have a place for you, and uh, and yeah. So what a treasure. So Alistair still lives here, um, and we make uh, you know the majority of our movies together, and um, for uh, for Dumpstar Media, we. So we've been making movies together for a really long time, but then we made it like official and started all these different, um, like we had an internship program through, um, uh, mostly through the University of Pittsburgh, but through like we had students who uh, went to school kind of, you know, all over the country and then maybe they were from Pittsburgh, so they would come back in the summertime. And uh, we gave a lot of people like their first onset experience. Um, and we, it was a lot of female filmmakers, mostly queer filmmakers. Um, and just anybody who was interested. So we were very, you know, like super lowbrow, like dirty, um, all of that. And like we, like that's our style, yeah. And really the like filmmakers going away and those resources going away and the community scattering. Um, and we didn't want to, you know, we didn't like want to scatter and um, and like, are still friends with each other, and like I've worked with so many people, like you know, still from filmmakers. Um, but that's when we felt really strongly about like, okay, let's make this official. Like, let's have something to cling on to. And a lot of people found us because we like you know started an LLC and then like the um, prototype incubator program and things like that. So like that hole, um, like we tried to fill it, you know. Um, and uh, so that's kind of how that happened. But yeah, I think by the time that I was at Filmmakers, um, there is there are so many people like doing cross disciplinary work and um and it didn't really feel like there was that many like silos. Um like a lot of people would, you know, kind of do the film and digital and do experimental stuff. And like I've kind of tried a lot of things across the board and landed in like narrative comedies. Um but yeah I feel like does this answer your question? Yeah, okay. definitely. Okay, so I have a question I'm going to pose to the audience to, th to think about, and then I have one more for, for our lovely panelists, and, th and then we'll open up to the audience. Um, 
So think about it, folks out there in the audience. We're back here in the Melwood screening room. Kind of weird, uh, but I, I'm, I'm really curious if, if uh, anybody out there has some Melwood memories you want to share. So if you got something you feel like you feel like is going to make a good little anecdote to share here in front of the in front of the audience, uh, yeah, think about it for a few minutes. Um, okay, and, and and back to our panelists. Or if if, if you have some Melwood memory you want to you want to share, <laughs> please do. But um, so so Peggy, you mentioned you mentioned something last night and tonight. You you referred to to two different films as time capsules. Um, which I think is really interesting. There's even, Natalka even has a film called uh, Time Capsule with True Bird Flight. Yeah. Um, and, and of course, maybe, maybe this is just inherent in the, the kind of event, we're, the, the kind of retrospective event we're doing right now. But um, that's a thing that stands out to me about all of these films is um, the, the time capsule nature of them. You, what, they're, the, what they're documenting at a place and a time uh, that... Even if it's something mundane, like uh, like Elizabeth's film, Elizabeth and Joe's film, I don't know if either of them made it. Uh, Conversations in Rhyme, a, a rather mundane thing, but I, I think I think documenting those those gestures and those games, it just I I actually just wrote, wrote an email to to Elizabeth earlier today saying how you know it it only grows in uh, in importance as, as the years pass. So so I'm wondering, um, did any of you ever? create work or, or do you create work with with that in mind with 10 20 with with, with the future and the future perspective in mind um, Steven's referring to a film I showed last night which is uh, found footage films that is from a uh, the material I got on YouTube which is a Taiwanese uh, company that makes animated news which I got very involved in this database of material and they it's very kind of low-end CGI stuff <clears throat> but it's all these news um, incidents and you know they're very timely they're very of a moment and news comes and goes as we know some things are more indelible than others um, but I worked I worked on the material thinking that in 20 years I'd like to see what it looked like to take all this material from 2016, 2017, 2018, and what it would, what it would mean as a, I mean, I collaged it as a collage of these incidents that happened uh, in this particular time period. That has to do with the Trump years, has to do with violence, the refugee, immigrant crisis. You know, it's like, the, it's all there uh, in the material. And I just, was, I'm not gonna bury it, but <laughs> it, it does, there's, as I was making it, I was thinking, this will be really interesting to see in 20 years. Now, the little movie that I showed tonight, um, you know, I, I remember shooting it, and I remember editing it, but I don't think I ever showed it. I can't remember ever showing it to the two guys who got married. I don't remember. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, and then I, the movie was just in a box, and I thought, oh, here's a movie, you know, what is this? You know, 20 years later. And the impulse to fix it is really strong. <laughs> you know, because tastes change, technology changes. You know, I, could have, I should have made a 4K version of it or something. But you know, the, the impulse to, to fix it for today's audience is incredibly strong. But I decided just to let it go. Because it, it is that, that's what it looked like then. And it, people would have accepted it at the time as like, you know, a Super 8 movie. But you know, now it's, um, it's trickier. It's trickier with what we, our eyeballs and our brains want to see on screen. So it, it is its own time capsule, not only the subject matter, but also just technically and the sort of quality of the movie is of, of is 1981. I'm really glad you bring that up because I think we, we saw, we had a really interesting survey of different original formats uh, tonight. I mean, I think everything was originally shot on film, but we saw a lot of we saw transfers from a lot of different eras and a lot of different types of videotape and digital digital video transferring and um, yeah so so that kind of baked into this assemblage is this uh, you know all all these different kinds of uh, technology um, and and you know so of course your your work Meg is is recent um, but that's 
you know, I, I, I see that in your work too, because you're, you're doing a lot of green screen work, um, at, at least in um, everything I can think of right now, actually, is that you've done, but I'm, I'm, sure, there, I'm sure you've done non-green non screen work as well. Um, which, you know, right now we're, we're, we're so used to that aesthetic, but I think it's, uh, do, do you ever think about uh, how, how, that, how that will age? Yeah, it's already aged um, for sure. Like it's, but also, um, it's not just like the technology, but like ourselves, like our talents, and um, and how we fine tune things, and um, how culture has changed, and how we influence that, and it influences us. And um, so, like the stories have changed. Like uh, we've, it, a lot of our stuff has been pretty topical. Um, in these kind of direct or indirectly in our in our stories, but yeah, um, the technology like dates itself, and I've like had a couple years playing in you know new media and VR and 360 and things like that, and part of that is you know you take a look at it and you know when it's from, so that gives you the context of how to view it, um, which is which is nice. But yeah, I mean I can look back at the things that I've made and look at the medium, but then also look at just like kind of where I was or anybody who has worked with me, like they can see like, oh, and then you learned this thing or you, you know, spoke more eloquently about something. So I feel like it's, um, it's kind of all in there. And yeah, of course I want to go back and like fix the cringe, you know, but then I'm like, oh, that's who she was. So yeah. And it's, I think it's going to keep happening. Yeah. I think we're only going to continue to grow. What I want to say, um, I love the wedding film because um, my friends and I have been talking, you know, as we're watching our, you know, people we love in our communities face anti-queer and anti-trans bills, right? And for a lot of us, we're like, that was our community. What? It's not that they were, ne they were always, our people were always around. Um, so I, I think it really speaks to that, like, what do you mean? <laughs> like, it's been a part of our culture and our art making and our communities and our family. So I, I loved it. I, I don't know if you need to fix it. <laughs> um, I want to say that uh, even though I didn't continue studying at Filmmakers, I never left film. So I was always working on somebody's film, the gaffer, the person who made sure that the props were in the right place, reviewing scripts. Um, more recently, working with Jose Monien on, um, as a co-producer, helping him find the right uh, writer for his film and the right actresses, and you know, watching it win awards, you know, like, and then recently joining the union and <laughs> trying to get some work through film. But I'm also, you find myself full circle um, trying to find a way to, as I'm dealing with um, certain invisible disabilities that prevent me from performing, right, as a musician, I find myself utilizing film. So for me, um, you know, the challenge is how do I represent the energy of performing music? And I'm, I'm utilizing film and I'm working with a, a team to, how do you do that so that it's not flat? How do you do it so it doesn't it doesn't look like just a video? And how do you how do you do it so that um, it incorporates accessibility? And so that's that's how I'm moving forward from the 1980s to now, like utilizing film to elevate this this craft and incorporate where I'm at in my life right now. And like, how do I communicate my art now? and utilize film to do that, but not make it a movie and not make it a video. So I don't know yet. <laughs> well, I'm excited. I, I was, yeah, when I, when I called you after um, Becca and Inbar had expressed interest in, in including your work, I, I, I was so excited to hear that, that you had mentioned that you're, what, what timing this is, because you're, um, you're working on a new video project. Um, what, so actually, one last thing before we turn it over to the audience. Do, do either of you have, have um, so Christiana, you mentioned what, what you're working on. Peggy or Meg, do you, do you have something you're working on right now you'd like to? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, 
<laughs> yeah, you'd, you'd like you'd like to plug. What about you, Meg? Have you have you got what's what's coming up next for Dumpstar Media? Um, so we have a lot of things that are in post production and like have been in post production for a long time. Um, and uh, so yeah, it's uh, it's a lot of work to like two busy people like run a production company. Um, so yeah, a lot of things have been on the back burner, but like we post our stuff to our YouTube channel, so it's Dumpstar Media, like not a dumpster, but like a star, and um, and uh, so that's where you can like find most of our most of our work. But there's a lot in the Movie vault. Dumpster. It's a movie dumpster, yeah. The booty dumpster. Bo- yeah, yeah, that's our that's our um, yeah our logo. It's like a dumpster with a big giant ass. It's great. It's a great one of the best logos ever. I'm pretty yeah, sure. It farts okay. out a star. I, I see a hand. I don't know who it is, but please uh, speak. I will speak. Um, there's no. There's no I'm always concerned opinion. with how artists are affected by social struggles, and conversely, how social struggles affect artists. The three of you, four of you, whatever. I mean, you come from a town that, from the '70s to '80s, became a drift a racially segregated, economically segregated, industrialized town which we lost our identity. We lost our jobs. A lot of what we had was gone. Did that affect you or did it not affect you? And if it did, how did it affect you in the art that you made? Thank you. Yeah, th- thank you for that question because there's, um, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to speak for that time period, but yeah, there's, so much more context than, than what we saw on screen here. So yeah, it, it's 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 important to um, to consider that. I, I wonder if I wonder if um, <laughs> okay. Pe- Peggy Peggy says she feel, feels like she left early. Um, what, what about you, Christiana? Did you have any any response to that? Or or you, Meg, if if you'd like. Um, kind of the only thing that I've really would um, want to say that I feel like I haven't really already said, but that speaks to that, is I used to think that Rust Belt Pride was so annoying. I'd just be like, shut up, like my dad, and you know, just like, oh, the bird. And I just thought it was so annoying. Um, but then, uh, you know, as I got older, and I, you know, there are more things that I hold really dear to my heart, and when something disrupts that, then like, yeah, then you hold it close, and then you talk about it more, and you promote it, and um, and that can go for a lot of different things. But I don't think Rust Belt Pride is annoying anymore. Um, I think it's very endearing, and um, so yeah, I think you know I um, I wasn't around in that time, but um, but you know with family holding that really close, um, I feel like is is how you keep that alive. Around during that time, and wa- you know, I'm watching my films and just feeling, uh, remembering how horrible that time was, and having to sell things to buy equipment, and it's it just, yeah. And I don't know if I put it in the films, but it made me remember um, what it was like trying to go to college and not um, having to work and um, watching your communities fall apart and watching every neighborhood be boarded up and you still had dreams and everybody else was losing them. They were losing them and you're, you know, uh, felt like you were living in a city of depression. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. And just trying to keep, you know, find, keep yourself motivated and stay focused on your dreams because it felt like everything else around you was burning, you know, and people were leaving and escaping, but you are young and you're stuck. <laughs> and so you have to find your way through that, um, that type of destruction. I think I hear Gary's voice. I'm going to ask after your answer. Okay. No, I was just uh, in, in terms of Mel's sort of question and, and Betsy Siemens, what you mentioned before. Uh, you know, she was a person that I really wanted to 
understand sort of like the cross cultural significance of this tactile early you know communication but but all of this was happening I mean we said so all those kids like they were the same man, right all those families were the same and that's sort of like before the politics before the religion before the economics before all of these other things that divides us so much that you know, are really 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 like Betsy's Trump's conversations in mind very strong pieces I know, so, uh, in response to culture and you know, what's happening these days. So just comment. I'm gonna put those, yeah, I'm gonna put those films in this series. She's not exactly a punk brain days. That would that would be a question for uh, for, for our curators. Um, so I, I my role here, I shared a lot of stuff with Becca and Inbar. And, uh, and and they they gravitated towards certain things. I, I was aware that yeah, that uh, conversations in rhyme is is somewhat of an of an outlier. It's um, you know certainly uh, you know in, ter in terms of my understanding of of the scene they were involved in. It's uh, 16 millimeter has um, NEA funding, um, so yeah, it definitely is. Uh, De definitely something of an of an outlier in in the in terms of the uh, the, the punk scene the 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 other punk uh, related films we saw here. Uh, and any other any other questions? Yeah. I think I saw. I yes. Have a oh, okay. okay. Harriet. It's a very good question. It's called Rust Belt Renegades. It didn't, these films and this selection didn't really represent the ethos, the angst of what was going on at the banana and the filmmakers in Oakland and Pittsburgh in the late 70s and the early 80s. It was the best of times and it was the worst of times. There were no jobs. There were no jobs. There were no jobs. There were no jobs. We were struggling. We were in poverty. To buy film stock was a struggle. And it was not completely represented with this selection of films. And I can answer your question, Will Packer. Thank you. And to Gary. Okay? Yeah. I have so many comments and questions. Peggy? Yeah. Who shot Teenage Love and that scene in the diner with Reed Paley and the five circling the diner? Is that in Teenage Love? Yeah. Who shot that scene? Did you shoot the I think movie? I shot that scene. Because that is such a beautiful scene. We didn't see it tonight, and I had always thought it was Rich and Warm. Yeah. Okay, Knife Point okay, was you. a beautiful film, by thank the way, that they did finish somewhat. <laughs> Not finished, but okay. Madame? Christiana? Christiana. Christiana? I think I knew your sister. And when I was watching those films, I thought it was you. And to address your question, Peggy, before we came in here tonight, you didn't know what was going on here in the last 20 what was going on in Oakland in 1977 to 1984 was amazing. It was a volcano. It was an orgy, Gary, of explosive artistic energy. And everybody did get along. Look at that wedding with Ken Leisure and Orange Day. That was like, that was our parties, yeah. right? They did have a scene here. It did not rival our scene, okay? But Megs, I saw you at Mr. Roboto Project as the opening MC for uh, the penis meeting. You are a comedic genius. I am a spotter. I'm just along for the ride here. <laughs> I mean, this is Re Rebecca and Inbar really did the heavy lifting here. Uh, 
Har- Harriet is often the wheels. I and mean, it's funny, I heard you saying there are no jobs, there are no jobs. That's what I was hearing when, when, when Mel a- asked his question, um, which I, I really do appreciate you bringing that context because it's not possible to, to, to put the entire, that entire context into a 70 minute program. Um, so, you know, you, 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 gotta, you gotta choose what, uh, choose the focus. And yeah, and I, I think we got a we got a great. I was not criticizing the selection. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah, I I didn't I didn't interpret the, it that like that at all. Uh, to to respond to Harriet though, uh, but thank thank you so much Harriet for um, for for the enthusiastic. Uh, <laughs> I, I I could hear your your words. Uh, Harriet and I have talked about this stuff at length, so I I often hear Harriet in my head. Um, I think I saw. I, yeah, I, I got. I, I saw another hand back there. Um, so my question was, uh, and it's relating to, to what's, what's just been talked about. Were there particular neighborhoods in Pittsburgh um, that you related to more strongly? So when I heard the talk about like the losing the jobs and the rest about, my mind goes to like McKeesport and the way like that area deteriorated. So I was just curious, uh, during your time working in Pittsburgh, if there were particular neighborhoods where you felt that more or that influenced you more. Is that directed at a particular person? Well, all of you, um, yeah. Well, well, Peggy, I know when we were talking earlier, you, you, were, you were talking about the South Side and and Christiana, we see we see some Carson Street and we see D's Cafe. We see uh, we see the brew house listed in the credits. Um, so I, I I get the I get the the sense that both of you uh, South Side might have been your stomping grounds back when it was a Bohemian neighborhood. Um, I lived at 18th and Carson Street uh, in the early 80s, in that across the street from the bank and the beautiful building with the windows. Uh, it's a huge a huge apartment. It was $75 a month, that apartment. But today I had like an hour to kill, so I was like, oh, I'm gonna take my favorite, one of my favorite drives. And I went over to the south side, and then I went up 18th Street up to Mount Oliver. I went all the way up. I, I always loved that, past Veronica's Vale, where that used to be, and up the, and up past the cemetery, which had the weeping Madonna at one point and then up over and then down the other side to the red, white, and blue thrift store. <laughs> and that's iconic to me. Uh, that's, uh, that's the, I just had to do that today. <laughs> I think we see you in something rare, something obscure, something famous, the J.T. Vale film. Um, I think we, that I was telling you that we see you giving a, giving a little tour uh, up a hill. I think that's it. I think um, I'm gonna have to share that with you. And one other so- uh, aside before before we continue on with that, is that is that Jim we see with the video camera in a Le Cirque wedding? Yeah, J T Vale is shooting a, a a camera, shooting some footage uh, in that movie. We sh- we sh- both shot. When the industry still industry stopped, all neighborhoods were affected. All 92 wasn't just McKeesport. There were families in every single one of those neighborhoods who worked in all the different, so I'm, I'm not sure what that means. Um, when, when we make our work, it is in some ways a time capsule because you cannot make something that doesn't reflect what you're living in, right? So reflect, what, if, if you want it to reflect what you think it needs to reflect, that, that is what you need to make, right? When we are dreaming and when we are making, it is a reflection of where we are and what we're dealing with. So um, the, the movies from these various time periods represent those moments, whether they're directly stating, stating that they are or not, because we're making them and we've, we're living through these situations and still trying to find a way to buy the film and develop it and, and, and find a place to show it. 
So there's, there's, no, there's no distance between that. There's no separation. There's no separation from one or the other for me, that is. Cannonsburg, where yeah. me and Peggy are from. <laughs> I agree. It created a, a space of family, right? A, a space to connect. Whether you were from the Mon Valley or from the city, like we were all kind of dealing with the situation. So I thought, film. Yeah, I agree. Filmmakers created created that space. A community magnet. Uh, Tony. I think. Yeah, one of the I thought was really depressing was Chetsky's film, it was Elizabeth's film, because we spent time with some relatives over Easter, and there was none of that. It was just looking at the screen, it's none of the touching, of it, the, the interaction that you see in that film has disappeared in, in, in families, in, in get-togethers. And I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, the people looking at this image today of the elderly man with the boy, we then think it's something perverse. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's it's, it's, yeah. yeah it, you know, it's really a, a strange, watching that, I just really was moved by the loss of that. Somebody would call the police on that one these days with all that touching. Yeah, that, um, it, it is, yeah, it's, it, uh, that, that's, that's really one of the things that, that triggered the, uh, in addition to the comments about time capsules, um, you know th th that one especially is I just think documents. Um, it's an, it's an ethnography, you know, uh, that's that, yeah that has disappeared. Um, and, and any other any other questions? Pam, hi, Zed. Black and white, and, and it didn't even have her name on it. She never really made it into a film. She never had it. <coughs> footage that she shot, I'm pretty sure it was a South Side uh, Goodwill or Salvation Army. And then it was Monroeville Mall. And it was sort of the haves and the have nots. And yet, even the haves, I mean, that didn't look very glamorous. The people who were coming out of the mall. Uh, Natalka's, what I knew of Natalka was she was always fantasizing that she was overcoming her working class background through film and pretending she was a star. And you know, I can't even finish that, but just want to put it out there. I think you got it. Yeah, I, I was definitely thinking of. Um, you know, anytime, anytime I see current autobiography and the scenes of her uh, going through the bags in, in her closet, that's something she repeated in, in the video women uh, piece that, that, you, that you made with her in the interviews. I, I think she does the same thing 10 years later, um, going, through, going through all these cons the consumer goods in, in, her, in her closet. Um, yeah, Harriet. But if I'm not mistaken, that was all a put on. Natalka was a poor mother with children to feed. She was incredibly frugal. She got her clothes at Goodwill and she made them look like Fifth Avenue. She had a fashion sense. Am I wrong about this? Like it makes her look like she just like had money to compulsively shop and she just said, say, if I had money, I'd be a really good professional order or something, you know. But that's 
sort of like, isn't that kind of a put on? Isn't that a show? Uh, 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 are you, are you, um, well, she didn't have a lot of, I mean, this is, we're talking about Natalka from the, from the first film. Um, she uh, had a very uh, developed persona, and, and she was very clever with her presentation of self. I mean, the, I could put it that way. And she sometimes had money, sometimes didn't. You know, she didn't, she had a, she, well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> she had resources, and sometimes she, Yeah. 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 She she was a. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, but you have to realize that she is uh, very strategic in the, her presentation of self in the movies, and there's a, a brilliance to the way she's using the film format, that she's making a movie within a movie. I mean, it's kind of incredible. And the way she keeps turning the conversation around these topics of money and her possessions and her chaos. I mean, she, it, it's a character. And it, you know, it's, a, it's beautifully done, really. And that, that she keeps cycling it back through you know, what is romantic and what are men for and what is the sexual relationships and where is the passion. But at the same time, she's controlling this sort of mechanism of film within film. And, um, you know, that's, this is what we see on screen. And we're taking, we're, I mean, I'm charmed by it. And I think she maintained that for, through a lot of her work. And uh, it was super brilliant. Um, her, her, as a person, she was complicated. As a person, she was complicated. But on screen, she's even more complicated. I just want to say, uh, I want to thank Stephen. Um, I want to tell everybody how I happened to be here. Last year, maybe it was two years ago, my partner, Sultan, his grandmother gave him the films, you can correct me, Z, if that's wrong, of his mother. Boxes and boxes of her films. We went to a thrift store and we're looking for a way to project the films. And then we encountered Prosser. We went to go see a movie, encountered That's Prosser, and Michael it was just Prosser. all Michael Prosser, but right? And it was just all for us. coming together that it led to Stephen. <laughs> and we started going to your house, maybe it was once a month, I can't remember, and viewing all of our work. And I, as a... Um, a woman and a filmmaker and an artist was blown away by all the different ways that she was talking about her com complicated personas and talking about her life and talking about what it is to be a woman and not be seen and not be maybe lifted, right? And so I found some connection with that and I asked Stephen if I could share my films because I hadn't ever really shared them with anyone. And that's how I arrived here, it was through Natalka, right? Through watching these films, hundreds. How many did we watch? <laughs> I think, so... Hundreds, it, or, it's, it's it felt like hundreds. It's, it's definitely not all of Natalka's work, but the, the ones uh, that, uh, that, that Zoltan brought, it's about 100 reels, yeah. Um, and I, maybe I should explain the background, because that is a really... Um, it's an interesting story, so I'll give the quick version of it. I know, I know, um, yeah, um, and and then 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 we'll wrap this up. Um, yeah, so so a big part of this whole project, but whatever whatever I want to call it, came about when uh, f this building was closing and and being emptied out, um, and you know people people know I'm into film and. Michael, uh, once again, he was working here. He, he made sure no film ended up in, in the trash. Um, so I ended up with all these films that were under the stairs over here, these educational reels and some other stuff, a whole two truckloads of, of films. And so I start going through them, and I immediately come upon uh, a canister uh, labeled 1982 Pittsburgh Filmmakers Traveling Program, which I knew what that was, and I knew the importance of it. Um, and I never, didn't think I'd ever get a chance to see it. 
So I got on the horn and started contacting some of the, you know, the folks who were there, and uh, Brady and Gary. I, I know, I know you're here also, and um, we got together and, and we watched the whole program. I have the Super 8 reels, um, and um, but Natalka's Natalka's film was missing, and so I I had heard about Natalka. I might have read a little bit about her. hadn't had any means of seeing her films, but we. So this just you know, then it's like, where where is Natalka's uh, excerpt from Teenage Love that was in in this program? And we were uh, we were just talking earlier today how we were we were at D's Six Packs in uh, over on, in Regent Square. Michael Brady Gary, I think I think you were there. Um, and it, it it came it came about uh, it came out of the conversation that uh, Zoe and Zoltan, two of Natalka's kids. Uh, Brady had mentioned, and and Michael was like, I know a Zoe and Zoltan. How many how many how many Zoe and Zoltan siblings could there be in Pittsburgh? <laughs> and so Michael had even known Natalka's kids and didn't didn't even know. And so that's how we got connected. And uh, that was actually late 2018, early 2019. It's time flies. And yeah, and then we had, over the course of six months or so watched watched all the stuff. All right. Well, I think. That's we're gonna have to wrap it up. Oh, okay. Sure. Yeah. Make it quick. Yeah. Yeah. We're. Uh, I. I want to know. I. That is one of the. That's a holy grail for me. To. Uh, we're. We're trying. Trying to. Trying to locate the. The complete teenage love, and. Um, I've managed to put together about twenty minutes of it from various sources. Um, but yeah, hopefully, hopefully we can we can turn that up um, sometime. Maybe if one of you has any leads, you can talk to me after. <laughs>